This is a BYU Sports Nation reviewable special. The 1981 basketball season presented by the BYU Store. Now from Studio B, here's Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. This is BYU Sports Nation, the Reviewables. We're back in Studio B and presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Wherever and however you're connected, great to have you with us. I am Spencer Linton, teamed up with retro BYU uniform collector Jerem Jordan. Hey, the unis uh, in 1980-81, short shorts, got a little royal blue in there, a little uh, you know, cursive. This is the greatest BYU basketball team ever. I'm just going to come out and say it right off the top. There's no team that was ever better than this one. There have been some good ones at BYU, but we're going to spend the next hour talking about the high points, the hot takes, the random facts, the iconic moments, and there's one that everyone knows about for sure, uh, including uh, we're going to talk to Fred Roberts, who was the number two scorer on this team. He plays in the NBA for a long time later. Uh, this is going to be a fun one. Yeah, I wonder what he remembers when you say that team, what's the first thing that pops into his mind? We'll ask him that question and much more. Uh, we'll also take uh, our reviewable special up to a wide-angle view from Y Mountain Let's as go. we look at what this 80-81 team accomplished, starting with BYU's only trip to the Elite Eight in program history, led by the National Player of the Year, Danny Ainge. Maybe you've heard of that guy. Yes, Ralph Sampson wins five of the eight national awards. Danny wins two. Mark Aguirre wins one. So Danny is one of the best players in the country, no doubt, and uh, ends up playing in the NBA for a long time after. This is the only trip to the Elite Eight. Now, other teams have come close, right? Uh, Jimmer Fredette and Jackson Emery and company in 2011 – Losing overtime to Florida, that would have been the second ever. In 51 and 66, BYU won the NIT. They chose to play in the NIT and not in the NCAA tournament. They won those tournaments. Perhaps they would have been in this, but this is a 48-team tournament. The top 16 teams get buys. BYU is not one of them. They are a sixth seed that goes to the NCAA tournament. Uh, third place in the WAC, which is a fun fact. BYU's greatest team ever didn't even win the league. Utah and Wyoming tied for the WAC championship. They were a game ahead, and both are top 20 teams going into the NCAA tournament. Yeah, pretty wild. And Utah, I mean, Tom Chambers, Pace Mannion, Danny Vrains, they were loaded. Yeah. Loaded. And Wyoming had uh, three NBA guys, Charles Bradley, Bill Garnett, no relation to Kevin, and Chris Angler. And don't forget, San Diego State was good, too. They had Michael Cage, who played in the NBA, and a uh, uh, fast point guard by the name of Tony Gwynn. Yes, that Tony Gwynn. Exactly. The Tony Gwynn that you interviewed he, when he was the coach of San Diego State Baseball. He played basketball as well. Uh, BYU uh, leads the league in scoring. They're ranked as high as 15th. They played 10 teams that season that were ranked in the top 20 of the AP poll going into the tournament. That's so amazing. not at the time, but that were actually good. Yes, so they played 10 teams, but more importantly, Jerem, they beat five of those teams that finished in the top 20. Yes, and two of those come in the NCAA tournament, two top 10 wins. How about that? You mentioned Danny Ainge. He was one of six NBA draft picks from this BYU roster. Eventually. Like, you, you have to go all the way out to 85. Um, and this roster is loaded as well, which is super fun. Of course, you have Fred Roberts and you have Greg Kite. Those guys play in the NBA. They're for stuck a, in the league. A long time, yes. You have Steve Craig, who is uh, Marie Osmond's husband. Not once, but twice, right? He's the, he's the two guard or the point guard with Danny in here. You have Timo Sarlainen, who ends up being the WAC player of the year when he's a senior. He's that, a freshman. Yeah, on he was team. down the bench. Right, yeah, he's down the bench. Uh, so this was, this was a tremendous, tremendous BYU team. The greatest ever. All right, we've talked about the overall resume, BYU beats five teams that finished in the top 20, but which of those wins would qualify as the best? Because as you just noted, Jerem, BYU beats two top 10 teams in the NCAA tournament back-to-back to to get to that Elite Eight, 10th-ranked UCLA, and number 7 Notre Dame. So they take down a three-seed, essentially, and then upset a two-seed. Beating UCLA... Beating is the appropriate verb there because the Bruins were absolutely destroyed by BYU. A 23-point win for the Cougars in the Sweet 16. Yes, I think Notre Dame's the best win, but UCLA should be in the convo. BYU wins this by 23 in Rhode Island in the second round. The Cougars had ended the regular season by beating Utah. More on that in a moment. That was a top-20 matchup in the Marriott Center and a record crowd. BYU goes to the NCAA tournament, beats Princeton, then plays three-seed UCLA, blows them out as the sixth-seed. Danny Ainge has 37 points. Then BYU beats Notre Dame. Then BYU loses to Virginia, who ends up losing in the Final Four. So this was a heck of a run. What a shot by Ainge, by the way. Hey, how about the little uh, dipsy-doo, the up and under? 
Yeah, Danny Ainge with 37 on 14 of 22 shooting in that game, four rebounds, four assists. So while BYU beating Notre Dame is the best win, it produces just the shot from Danny Ainge. The best performance overall the season was the 23-point win against UCLA. I think so. And then let's talk about Utah. That's the regular season finale. There's no conference tournament at this point. BYU is ranked 18th. And Utah is ranked ninth. It's senior night. Yes. So Mark Pope talks about, hey, the 2020, greatest senior night ever. that amazing senior night taking down number two ranked Gonzaga. BYU had a top 20 showdown on senior night in 1981. Should we tell them or not? <laughs> <laughs> There's a Marriott Center record crowd of 23,108 in this game. That's going to stand forever because they've they've... Brought the uh, attendance down to 19,000. BYU trailed by double figures in this game. They win by 19 points. And, and that, this was a Utah team that was going to win the league and be a higher seed than BYU. Wyoming and Utah do not move past where BYU went. BYU ends up being the best team in the WAC despite taking third place. So the Utah game, Princeton, UCLA, Notre Dame, three of those wins in four games is Really good. What a run. Three top ten wins in four games. I mean, that is impressive stuff. Yeah, what a run. And here's why it's better than 2011, Spencer. In 2011, BYU was the three seed, and it was awesome. But BYU played a 14-seed Wofford. BYU earned the right to play a bad team. But then St. John's was the six seed, got upset by 11-seed Gonzaga. So BYU plays a 14 and an 11, and then loses to a two. That run does, pales in comparison to BYU being a six, beating an 11, beating a three, and beating a two. That's why this team is better than 2011. Okay, so best win, beat Notre Dame, the two seed, a top 10 team, you get to the Elite Eight. Best overall performance, 23-point win over UCLA. And then it's just a senior night of all seniors, a senior night that would compare to what BYU did against Gonzaga. Yes, uh, you're beating a top 10 team at home. I don't think that and it's your there was rival. a court storm. That's be- well, Gonzaga yeah, is, that's what I'm is And right? it's your rival. That, let's not tell them. Because it might be as good or better. <laughs> In front of a record crowd. Let's not tell them. The, the biggest no crowd one tell them. that will ever gather. In the Marriott Center. 23,100. Well, and it's Danny Ainge's finale. There's going to be some Devo that has more. Danny Ainge's <laughs> finale. Oh, incredible. Okay, the season MVP. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. It's Danny Ainge. Yeah, it's Danny Ainge. He won two National Player of the Year awards. You mentioned Ralph Sampson, uh, who, uh, ironically enough, BYU faced in the Elite Eight and lost to Virginia. But Danny Ainge is the season MVP. No doubt. In the biggest games, he there's, showed up. There's he, that shot again. He just doesn't get enough credit for how athletic he was. Oh, well, let's talk about it. So he had played the previous two years, right, sophomore, junior year. He had played with the Blue Jays, not in the minors, in the majors while he's at BYU. He had signed a $300,000 uh, you know, signing bonus and, and contract. So he's a big deal. He's this great NCAA basketball player. Of course, he makes this shot against Notre Dame. He also sets a record with 112 straight games of double figures. That's an NCAA record at the time. When he leaves BYU, he's not only the all-time leading scorer, he leads in assists and steals. He's also the all-time leading scorer in the WAC. Danny Ainge was unbelievable as a basketball player, but also as a baseball player. He didn't even play baseball at BYU because he's in the stinking majors, man. He does it all without a three-point line, too. If there was a three-point line, Tyler Haas and Jim Fredette don't, pa- don't ever pass him, in my opinion. I don't think they do. Danny Ainge, GOAT status, and he produced the iconic moment of the 1980-81 BYU basketball season. Let's relive it from the NCAA tournament in the Sweet 16. And there are eight seconds to go. Ainge against Paxson. Five seconds. Inside. Ainge scores for two seconds. One second on the clock. It is all over. Pandemonium at the Omni in Atlanta. Sorry, the Omni. Omni would be the Book of Mormon pronunciation. Son of Jerem, by the way. (laughs) I I would know. I'm glad you called me out on that. All good. Okay, in Atlanta. So he, he goes around John Paxson and eventually the scoop over oh. the outstretched arm of Orlando Woolridge. BYU's in the Elite Eight. Everyone knows this play and has watched it, right? Let's break down and tell you a couple of things that maybe you've never noticed. So earlier in the game, a few minutes prior, there's a steal by BYU. Danny Ainge gets the ball, and look, he goes up. Orlando Woolridge hits it. That's a goaltend. That's a goaltend. So later when this same play happens, I don't think Orlando Woolridge goes up 
with the same fervor and look at him. He's very disappointed. So Ainge gets the ball behind the back dribble, gets past three Notre Dame defenders into the lane, and it's the same play. Yes, if Woolridge does block it, it's a goaltend and BYU wins anyway. But will they call that in that moment? I don't, know. I don't know, right? I don't know. So or the fact that Ainge went to the same move again in the same spot in that moment is wild. The other thing is this. Kelly Trapuco plays in the NBA for a long time as well. He puts Notre Dame up prior to Ainge getting the ball. Makes just a ridiculously tough shot. From the baseline, contested shot. Trapuca ends up going back down the court. He calls timeout. He sits down. He's cramping up. Trapuca is the help side defender, the third guy at midcourt, that doesn't get in front of Danny. Because he had been cramping up. So Ainge is able to get all the way into the lane. We need to ask Digger Phelps about this, the head coach of Notre Dame. He's got a couple of markers. Why was Kelly Trapuca on the floor? Well, (laughs) Would it have been different? Right, perhaps. And did that goaltend play a role there? And and, uh, Fred Roberts had fouled out at that point. (laughs) Man, it was crazy. So, yeah, a little little background that uh, maybe you hadn't thought about or didn't know. All right. As we move on in this reviewable special, it's time to open up the vault, Jerem. Yes, Danny Ainge drops 37 on UCLA. We'll show you some of the highlights. Plus, some high heat on the way. Was 1980-81 the best year ever in BYU athletics as a whole? This is BYU Sports Nation, The Reviewables. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store. Official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Greetings again from Studio B and BYU Sports Nation, the Reviewables. I am Spencer Linton alongside Jerem Jordan. The 1980-81 BYU men's basketball season put together just an historic run and filled the Marriott Center to record highs. That said, let's tip off our second segment with some high heat, Jerem, our Reviewables hot takes. And I'll start. Maybe this isn't so hot, but upon further review... I think that 1980-81, not just for BYU basketball, but for BYU athletics as a whole, was the greatest year ever in athletics history. I agree with you. 1981, men's golf wins the national championship. Awesome. I like those. 1980-81, BYU football wins their first ever bowl game, and it's the Miracle Bowl, no less, with Jim McMahon connecting with Clay Brown on a Hail Mary after they trailed by 20 points with under four minutes to play against SMU. Who would have thought that that play and Danny Ainge Notre Dame happened in the same sports year? That is September to April or May. That's the same sports year. It's unbelievable. Are you kidding me? Then BYU basketball makes the Elite Eight run, not to mention BYU baseball under Coach Tuckett at the time was also amazing. Two years later, they're number one in the country at one point in the season, not to mention Steve Young shows up in football. Where's the DeLorean? Can we go back to 1980 to 1985? No, No, because we'd mess it up. We'd, 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 you know, all of a sudden we got the picture of the team and people were disappearing. No. We yeah. can't do that. Yeah. Don't do it. And then your mom has a crush on you. Yeah, that's always weird, right? <laughs> it's like the weirdest thing about Back to the Future. I agree with you that 80, 80 81, that sports year, is the best in BYU history. What's, what's For those three than reasons. No, no one can challenge that. I mean, there are other seasons who have had significant things. I think men's golf helps push it over the top as well. The fact that you got a national championship in another sport. That's amazing. Okay. This is this is high heat, but I don't. I think we all agree. Maybe some people don't. This is the greatest team in BYU, BYU basketball history. But Jim or Jerem? Now, if you're on the 51 NIT champs, maybe you feel like, wait, we were just as good in our day against our competition. Same with the 66 NIT champs. They had a Hall of Fame coach. Yes, they did. Stan Watts, who's in the Basketball Hall of Fame. But this team, it's not just that it's the Elite Eight and Danny Ainge. It's that it's Fred Roberts, that it's Greg Kite, that it's Timo Saarlainen, who's the WAC player of the year in 85 and later as well. And it's the resume, well. Jerem. And it's the resume. Yes, who they beat in the regular season and who they beat, in the, more importantly, the postseason. The 79-80 team was a better team in the regular season. They finish higher. They win the WAC. Uh, then they are a three seed. They're a higher seed. But... They play in Ogden, and they don't beat Clemson after a bye, and so we don't talk about them. But they had Alan Taylor, who was a double-double guy. They had Devin Durant, who becomes a top-five scorer in BYU history and plays in the NBA as well. But this team, 80-81, is defined by the run they made in the NCAA tournament, going to Rhode Island, uh, Providence, that is, and beating Princeton and UCLA, then going to Atlanta and beating Notre Dame, 
and losing to Virginia. And Danny Ainge and all the accolades. And Ainge is playing for the Blue Jays as well, by the way. I mean, this is the greatest basketball team in BYU history. And like I said in the previous segment, 2011 uh, tries to hold a candle to this team, but their resume says we beat a 14 and an 11 seed. It just doesn't stand. If, if BYU had beaten Florida, the two seed, I think we start to compare these two teams because perhaps we go modern era, maybe it's harder for a team like BYU to do this or something. But the 2011 team, to me, is in the conversation for the second best team and probably is the second best. Yeah, the 2011 team had some quality wins as well. San Diego State was a no top doubt. 10 team. Awesome. BYU beat them twice. Yeah, B- BYU had regular season victories akin to that as well. It's what this team did in the postseason. And there have been some amazing BYU football teams. When, when the 96 team goes and beats Kansas State, a top 20 team in the Cotton Bowl, it cements and validates that this was an all-time team. And sometimes you don't have to do that. For example, 84 football beats Michigan. Michigan was 6-5. and five. That was no big deal. But they were undefeated. They didn't have a blemish. They are the greatest team in BYU football history, perhaps, because they're a national champ. So I'm about to draw a parallel here that may bring a tear to my eye. This oh my 1980-81 BYU basketball show? team. No, but I've been close a couple Oh, okay. Times. Here we go. 1980-81 BYU basketball as a six seed, riding high after an emotional rivalry win on a crazy capacity field uh, senior night for Danny Ainge and some other notable players. They take this momentum and go into the NCAA tournament as a six seed and go all the way to the Elite Eight. 2019-2020 BYU basketball beats Gonzaga. Emotional senior night, capacity crowd. They're going to be a six seed, do you think? Yes. Lenardi had, tournament. Lenardi had them as a six. And we... A lot of national punts are like, this BYU basketball team had enough shooting, enough leadership, enough star power that they could have made in the Elite Eight run. <laughs> it's so sad. COVID-19 eliminates BYU 2019-2020 basketball. They were the Virginia pandemic. Yeah, if you will. Yeah, okay. Let's okay, not cry. Let's seed. move on. I'm always about the six seed. Six man. seed. Let's go. Six seed. 80-81 plays into that. That's yeah. for sure. Okay. Uh, on to our Jackson Emery Award. The second the best player. Second best player on this BYU basketball team. To me, this is clear. It's Fred Roberts. He averaged almost 19 a game, shot 58% from the field, eight boards a game. He's all whack. In the NCAA tournament, four games, 75 points, 43 boards, 17 assists. Wow. The next year, he's a junior. The next year, he is, uh, you know, one of the best players in the whack, 27th pick overall. Um, he was the guy that played in the NBA for a long time, played with the Celtics and Lakers, among others. Fred Roberts was legit, man, and we will talk to him coming up. It's, it's time that we give some, some time and credit to the, the second best player, right? So, yeah. That's why we have the Jack Snever Award. Let's go. Yeah. Fred Roberts, who scored 33 points in an NBA playoff game against Isaiah Thomas and the Detroit Pistons. Dennis Rodman was guarding him for a lot of that game. I mean, that, <laughs> that is underrated as well. Yeah, so he, he ends up being the second leading scorer when he leaves school. I mean, he, he's an all-timer here as well. All right, look forward to that interview with Fred Roberts, the second leading scorer in BYU history at the time when he left. And now for our High Motor Guy Award, Jerem. <laughs> I love that we have this. Who gets the High Motor It's Greg Balif. Greg Balif. He's a junior. He's lefty. He's averaging 4.7 points per game. He's a guy that comes in and makes some free throws, has, uh, has the steal I mentioned that led to that haircut was amazing for Greg. <laughs> He ends up giving BYU the lead that Notre Dame then takes back before Danny Ainge makes the shot. Why is Greg Balaf shooting that shot? You're the national player of the year. But Greg Balaf, he didn't care. He's going in, baby. High motor. It's Greg Balaf. Yes, I'm glad you pointed that out because it's a back-and-forth game in the Sweet 16 at the Omni, not the Omni. We're learning here. And Greg Balaf is open for a jump shot from 17 feet away, takes it, no hesitation. This is the shot. And knocks it down. BYU's up one. There's under a minute to play. The Cougars might win the game. It might be Greg Balaf that's the hero. <laughs> you remember Notre Dame when BYU went to the lead in and Greg Balaf made the shot? We're giving Greg Balaf so much love here. I love it. I love it. So congratulations. High motor, motor guy. High motor guy. Okay, coming up, Fred Roberts, a.k.a. the Jackson Emory Award winner of the 1980-81 Team will join us. Plus, the final moments and points of Danny Ainge's 37 point outburst against UCLA, part of our reviewables vault. This is BYU Sports Nation.
BYU Sports Nation, the reviewables continues. An in-depth review of the 1980-81 basketball season. He is Jerem Jordan. I am Spencer Linton, and this is The Vault. Before Danny Ainge dropped the legendary finger roll shot against Notre Dame to send the Cougars to their first and only Elite Eight, he scored 37 points in a 78-55 blowout victory of the three-seed UCLA in the Sweet 16 of that 81 NCAA tournament, 14 of 22, 63%. Jeremy's final two points of the game came from the free throw line. And just before he exited the game, it is there that we open up the vault to watch and listen as Dick Enberg, Al McGuire, and Billy Packer had the call for NBC. A blowout by BYU in Providence. 45 seconds left. Rebound Roberts. Haynes releasing. Break. Haynes. Hello with the left hand, tipped in by Trumbo. And let's take Ainge out of here. Yep. And $1,000 scholarship to Brigham Young University in the name of that All-American number 22, Danny Ainge, sensational athlete, 35 points today. And now a standing ovation from this Providence crowd for Ainge and this fine BYU team. He can't be substituted for it because he's on the foul line, but he'll be coming out right after. at the line. We're in the final minute here in Providence. Dick Henberg with Al McGuire, Billy Packer, Danny Ainge, the most valuable player in this game, has just scored his 36th point. He's only four away from his all-time high at BYU. A great All-American. He leaves the game with 37 and an appropriate standing ovation. For those of you who were not with us, with 9 for 11 from the floor, 5 for 5 from the line, finishes with 36, 37 points today. And, uh, boy, it's a shame we we haven't been able to show him to the nation more often. He is as fine a player as we've seen in quite a while. Just happens to be in the wrong time belt. (laughs) (laughs) You know, you're right. (laughs) That Rocky Mountain zone is a tough one. They're showing the nation they've got uh, someone to consider. Holton hits two seconds, and the ball game is over. Brigham Young University will advance to Atlanta and will play the winner of the second game today between Notre Dame and James Madison. BYU has won it. A lot of things I love about that vault trip, and uh, the final one, looking at a young Roger Reed. Yep. Accompany Frank Arnold over to the uh, handshake line. And, oh, BYU. by the way, Frank Arnold had been an assistant at UCLA six years prior. Yes, yes. That UCLA team was coached uh, by Larry Brown, which is one of our random facts that we open up. And there are a ton from this season, just little nuggets of gold within this BYU season as we go into some more random facts. Yeah, Mark Eaton was on that UCLA team. He was young, didn't play very much. But, uh, yeah, Larry Brown's last game as UCLA coach, he bounces and, and goes to the NBA, comes back to college. Uh, the starting two guard for BYU, perhaps point guard, uh, Steve Craig. He marries Marie Osman later, and then uh, they get divorced. They get remarried later. They're married today. So second, that's fun. Marie Osman, awesome. Um, I do want to mention Steve Trumbo was really good on this team. Third leading scorer. BYU was really big on that front line, which was awesome. Uh, we should mention that BYU beat St. Mary's by yes, 19. Yes, just because we can. Okay. <laughs> Shout, shout out to uh, St. Mary's, little BYU P- beating by 19 little, that season. Little P&V, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, Trumbo was a double-double guy, by the way, which is awesome. Always good to have those. BYU doesn't really have those nowadays. I think Eric Mika a couple years ago did that. Yoli Schatz almost did that uh, in 2019-20. Yeah. No shot clock, no three-point line. Yeah, boring. So you see some of these low-scoring games, you can understand why that happened. I think but BYU, BYU led the whack in scoring. They were a fast-paced team. The year before, BYU had played a game at Wyoming and scored 37 points in the game and won. Oh, gosh. Because I, there's no shot clock. I think Wyoming had the ball. There's yeah. no shot clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I've read stories. Wyoming held the ball in that game, of course. Uh, 48 team tournament. So the top 16 teams had a bye. BYU is not one of the top 16, even though they finished in the AP poll going into the tourney, number 16. So they probably felt like, oh, we should have had a bye, but it ends up being all right. The matchup with UCLA was perfect. BYU wins that by 23. And then Notre Dame, that was the slugfest. And then, of course, Virginia was tough with Ralph Sampson for BYU to match up there. I know NCAA All-American typically gets attributed to Danny Ainge and Jimmer Fredette, but there were three All-Americans on this BYU team. Ainge, Fred Roberts, and Greg Kite. All three of those guys stuck and made a significant impact in the NBA. Greg Kite got All-American. He averaged 8.3 points a game. Wow. Okay. Um, there is a fun story, too. BYU beats Tennessee in a tournament uh, in, in uh, Knoxville, and that night was the same night that the Miracle Bowl happened. Now, Paul James is there with the men's basketball team because they didn't have the rights to call the game on the radio in San Diego, a different era. So the, it's not on TV either nationally to where they could watch it in Tennessee. So Paul James calls uh, the network to get the radio feed down the line, and he does his own play-by-play to Danny Ainge and members of the team in the hotel. And they don't believe it that BYU came back and won. And, and in fact, Danny Ainge's dad says to Paul Dang it, you better be telling the truth. <laughs> Paul James told that to my face one time, just he and I chatting. Can you imagine? You're, crazy. It's 45-25 with three minutes and 57 seconds to play. The game's over. And they're, they've just won. They've just beaten Tennessee, and they are sitting. No, they lost to Tennessee. Oh, they, ten, they lost. They lost. They beat somebody else of note. I'm trying to remember so who it was. This, yes, they played in tournament. This, this brought them up. They're in the hotel trying to get results of this game. Remember, BYU's tough. 20 team, McMahon, the whole deal. And Paul James doing play by play to them sitting in this room. Crazy. They, they, they beat Illinois, and Illinois was a top 20 team. That was a significant win. Yeah, Thank you. So, good uh, neutral site comp or tournament that they yes. were playing early season. So, yeah, yes. they beat Illinois. They lose to Tennessee, but then the spirits are revived. <laughs> yes, they are. He wins 46 45. Did we mention the St. Mary's loss? We did. Okay. You already played Utah State twice for some reason? Home and road. But the home game is the fifth most attended game in BYU history. What? That's crazy. So two of the top five in BYU history are from that year. That's how special that team was. People showed up. Listen, BYU fans know when something's special. They, they make it happen. They show up and they support. And we have two of the top five crowds of all time in the Merit Center. Now, here's another random note for NBA fans specifically. Kevin O'Connor, who has played a large role with the Utah Jazz Mm -hmm. in shifting things, he was an assistant coach to Larry Brown on that UCLA team. Nice. So that UCLA staff was loaded. and They didn't coach very well that game, though. UCLA had gone to the national championship game the year before, losing to Louisville. So they were expected to be pretty good, and they're a three seed. So UCLA is back and good, but... BYU shows up and uh, runs them off the floor. <laughs> I, and I love just how many NBA guys are sprinkled around. So we talked about Utah with Vrains and Chambers and Wyoming with and their— And Pace Manion. And Pace Manion. And Wyoming with their three guys. And San Diego State with, uh, you know, Michael Cage and uh, Tony Gwynn was on the basketball team as well. And then you play Notre Dame, and you mentioned Orlando Woolridge, Kelly Tripuka, John Paxson. Yeah, that John Paxson that hits the 93, uh, you know, NBA Finals series clinching uh, game winner in the yeah, last dance for the Bulls. Much to the, the chagrin of Charles Barkley and Phoenix Suns fans. Yes, Notre Dame also had Tracy Jackson, Tom Sluby, and Joe Klein, who also played in the NBA. BYU had six draft picks off this team. The draft is 10 rounds, so it's different. But you have three guys that end up playing in Ainge. And Roberts and Kite. I'm trying to remember. Joe and Klein, Trumbo was an international star in Spain as yeah, well. Yeah, Joe Klein came back to coach against BYU as an assistant. I can't remember the team he came back with a few years back mm. and, and was featured on BYU too. So I remember that Notre Dame nugget getting brought up. Nice. Yeah. Okay, coming up, who won the season? Plus, a man who scored 33 points in an NBA playoff game against the bad boys, the Detroit Pistons. One of the stars from the 1980 81 team, Fred Roberts, joins us next. This is BYU Sports Nation, the Reviewables. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, 
the official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. BYU Sports Nation, the reviewables continues from Studio B, the 1980-81 BYU basketball season under the microscope. And here to help us cross-examine everything now is NBA veteran and former BYU star Fred Roberts, who joins us on the Deseret First Credit Union Hotline via Zoom. Fred, welcome. When I say 1980-81 BYU basketball, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Oh, man, first thing, well, it's got to be the Notre Dame game because that's what's been played over and over through the years. Uh, and then I go right to uh, the, uh, the the entire NCAA, NCAA tournament, which was just a ton of fun. Uh, it was exciting. And our whole team, uh, it was just a fun – overall, I, even though we uh, – I know we've had to, every season you have the lulls and you have some bad weeks, but uh, I do not remember 81 that way. I remember it just as a good year, a good team. The guys got together and we felt like we could go out and win any game we played. And that, that, those are the things I remember. It's the greatest team in BYU history, and we'll dive into that. And that's why we're doing the show. But I want to go back to 79 and 80. We've, we've looked at the team before the team. And you guys perhaps were more talented with Alan Taylor, a double-double guy as a senior, and a sophomore, Devin Durant, before he goes on a mission. That's why he's not on the 80-81 team. Was that team more talented? I think, uh, gosh, maybe not at that moment, but if we, if Devin had come back the next year and been the kind of player that he is, uh, there, no question, we're more talented. Plus, then, then you have Trumbull coming off the bench, Got Kite coming off the bench. Uh, um, you know, Big Al, he, he had a great year. He had a great senior year. He stepped it up. He came back. Uh, that's 79, 80, I, th- I think is what you're talking about. Uh, he came back strong, healthy, lean. Uh, he was kind of a uh, big big guy for us that year. And uh, I don't know, maybe Devin and I were too young to really – have a belief, but we did win the whack, and then but we I, we ran into a tough team with Clemson. I think that was we ran into a hot team, Clemson. They came out, they had nothing to lose. They had good players. They started six ten, six ten, six eleven. Whoa! And yeah, they were you know Larry Nance was on that team. Uh, this Horace White kid, six six eleven, and uh, the big Campbell kid in the post. And I can't remember who their guards were, but man, they they wore us out. So that 79-80 BYU team is a three seed going into the NCAA tournament, ranked number 12. As you mentioned, you were the WAC champions, and you had a bye in the first round before you took on Clemson. Because of the result in 1979-80, losing to Clemson, how did that factor into the way you approached the NCAA tournament run the next season when you make it all the way to the Elite Eight? Well, we kind of had the opposite of what Clemson had the year before. Um, where we didn't have the – that buy-in thing sometimes can be hurtful. I think it was for us up in Ogden. We're, Clemson had played a game. They were feeling good about themselves. They were uh, prepared. I, I, I don't know. Just they, they'd they already been in the pool. And when you're sitting there and you're play, waiting for somebody to, that's already playing, it, it kind of it sometimes works against you. And I think that's what happened. We went back east where people didn't expect us to do anything. We were kind of out of the uh, publicity because of any finishing third in the whack. They sent us back east. And so that pressure was off us. And, uh, but it was exciting because we were back east and we were in a good pool. And I think we snuck up on UCLA. Princeton, maybe not so much, but that was, that was just a, game but then we come up and we'd already played the game we're going against UCLA and we caught them sleeping I think they looked at a bunch of big white guys and they said they are not going to run with us and (laughs) and we ran with them and uh, it was that game was over pretty quick beating UCLA by 23 anytime no matter how good bad UCLA is this is three seed UCLA this is a top 10 team in the country how did you guys uh, smack UCLA down so well in that game well you know for one, i don't know why we weren't uh i don't know ucla i grew up people my generation what grew up watching ucla win their nancy two a championships every year had a great i had had a great respect and love for the ucla teams and i 
just excited. I cheered for them. And then we're going to play them. And there was a couple of guys I had, I had played against in summer leagues. And I think that helps, you know, because you're familiar with them. You're not, I'm not going in. I don't, I didn't know it. You go in, normally you go in and you don't know anything about these guys other than what you read the paper. But I knew some of these guys because I played with them in the summer league. And I thought, oh, we, we play with these guys. And, and then the biggest thing probably was Ainge just went crazy that game. He, uh, I think he saw that it was his chance, his time to, to really go crazy. <laughs> and he was, he, and he got hot because uh, he was letting, he was shooting everything. Just like we throw <laughs> the ball in in a half court and he'd pull up. It would have been a three pointer, but we didn't have three pointers in dribble down. He'd pull up one on three nail it he'd come down and do it again and he just i think he had 37 points that game yeah and that just uh you know we we just ran those guys to death and then they couldn't uh they couldn't break our size we had like the year before against clemson we couldn't break down their size and the juice lake couldn't break down our size we they had a bunch of six 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 seven guys and we just zoned them and they couldn't shoot and <laughs> We just brushed. I talked to Mark Eaton about that, and Mark Eaton was sitting on the end of the bench. Didn't I think he played maybe a total of twelve minutes that year with UCLA? And he says, he says, yeah, that game was so frustrating. He said, I looking out there, all you big guys, and we're trying to go small, didn't work. <laughs> yeah, that, that certainly didn't. Losing by twenty three, UCLA. Uh, but then you earn the opportunity to play Notre Dame, and so I mean. No rest for uh, the weary. If you're BYU basketball, you got to turn around and, and take on Notre Dame, which is a team that's loaded with talent, including Kelly Trapuca and Orlando Woolridge, John Paxson. So why were you able to go toe-to-toe with Notre Dame shortly after beating UCLA by 23? Well, at that point, we were feeling pretty good about ourselves. And we, you know, and also throughout the season, it wasn't like we, we were pretty well prepared because – the WAC was great. There was some really good players and good teams. And so we go into uh, UCLA and Notre Dame. We felt like we could play. Uh, and that Notre Dame team, they did. They, they, the difference between them and uh, UCLA is that they had shooters. They had Tripu could just, could just flat out shoot. Paxson could shoot. They had size. They had a Tracy Jackson uh, who was uh, – all conference or I don't even know if they were in conference then, but I I remember playing against him. And he's a great player. And so I think we just felt like we just had a, there was a good uh, synergy with the, with the players, with the guys, the coach, coach Arnold prepared us really well for those games. He, uh, we came in with game plan and we trusted the game plan. We trusted in each other. Uh, I just, that was a, uh, I don't. I don't even look at it like it was intimidating because it just felt exciting and thrilling, and to be there and be in Atlanta, uh, going up against these guys. And uh, unfortunately for me, I the, what I do remember mostly about for me uh, that UCLA game is uh, I had uh, I got foul trouble pretty early. I I had three offensive fouls. <laughs> Two of them were on jump shots. <laughs> <laughs> Well, not going to be good for me. So you wa- you watched, uh, didn't you foul out? I think you fouled out with the 144 to go or something. So you watched the the game-winning greatest play in BYU history uh, from the sideline. That's exactly right. I was on the bench directly across parallel with the basket. And I think we talked about this before, but uh, what, what I thought was interesting it, must have fallen asleep. I was there, so I was there somewhere. <laughs> but, <laughs> we can, yeah, we can see on the BYU bench. Yeah. But anyhow, four or five play, plays before that, Ainge goes in almost the same shot, and Orlando Woolridge goes up. He blocks the shot, goaltending, and so they get a shot, and then that play happens again, and uh, Orlando goes up, and you can see him. He's kind of short, short arms it. And we talked about this earlier in the show because upon review of this, Fred, I made the same observation. I said, oh, my gosh, this is the same play. 
and Orlando perhaps is affected in that moment. So you feel like he doesn't challenge that shot the same way he would have because he had a goaltend early in the game? I feel like he's blocking that shot for sure. I mean, if it's not come, if it's not crunch, and you know he, he blocks a shot and it gets a, a goaltending again, he loses the game because he goaltends. Uh, that would have been a tough one to take. I think he was concerned about that because you can kind of see he pulls back. And Orlando, he can block anything. <laughs> he's so good, right? All time. Fred Roberts with us on. We are 1980-81 BYU basketball reviewable special uh, right in the midst of it. Um, you mentioned how good the WAC was that year. Wyoming and Utah were a couple of teams that finished the, the season ranked. And you played in front of a Marriott Center record crowd, 23,106 fans when BYU beat then ninth-ranked Utah to close out the regular season. What was that experience like when you trailed the Utes by double digits but then end up blowing them out of the water? That game I do remember and was so much fun. Um, <laughs> We start that game, and you know, of course, the fans. That was the, I think that was the first time they started uh, when the other team, the opposing team, was being introduced. They had the newspapers out and the re- or newspapers <laughs> playing, paying no attention to that. We thought that was pretty cool. And they're screaming at home for us. And I think we started the game out, it was either 10, 10 to 0 or 10 to 2 for Utah. And they came down, they hit their first sh- five shots. You know, bank of, bank, uh, anyway. He, they, they were hidden from outside. Brains and chambers were dunking. They're just killing us, and um, and that thing turned around. And next thing you know, <laughs> we get on those guys, and uh, we just put it on them. You end up being that was uh, after great fun. Yeah, what? And that is still the most attended game in the Merritt Center to this day, which is pretty cool. So you end up I guess uh, it will be forever because they changed the Merritt Center, right? Right. It probably will be forever. That's a great point. Uh, you become, uh, you know, after the next season, uh, the 27th pick in the draft, you play in the NBA. You're teammates with a lot of great guys, notably Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. You have 33 points in a game, uh, you know, in, in the playoffs. What, what do you recall from uh, what was a very fruitful and long NBA career? You know, I just, I really can look back and think I remember just having, I loved playing. I loved playing. I loved competing. I loved my teammates. Uh, all except for one team. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> things, things got a little weird at uh, the last couple of years of my career. Uh, players and teams were just so different. These young guys coming in. I remember when I came in the league, they, somebody told me, he said, we need to keep young guys so we can have good hard practices, so we can have some energy and focus. And uh, and then at, toward the end of my career, somebody told me, he says, we got to keep you old guys so we can have some good hard practices. It's <laughs> <laughs> sure true. Those young guys, they just thought, well, practice? What are you practice? You know, it wasn't that, uh, what was that little point guard who had Al- that? Allen uh, Iverson. Allen Iverson, practice? I don't know. And that's kind of was the attitude of these guys. It was just, and I don't think that's the case now. I see these guys now. It's unbelievable their conditioning and their preparation. Um, you know, they would, everybody, you know, Carl Malone was a, we had big, strong guys, but Malone came in and now all of a sudden he, that changed and people started lifting weights. And now everybody's built like Carl Malone. They can run like uh, Michael Jordan. Well, Carl Malone had his heyday on one of your former teammates, Brad Lowhouse. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I think things happen, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know, I, I think I got a little bit of that. <laughs> Every time I go up to watch one of those games, I'm sitting there. I, I'm able to. I'm fortunate enough to go to all the Milwaukee games when they play up there, and they haven't. Milwaukee hasn't won up there since 2000 or something like that. And uh, they always seem to play those clips, replay those clips up on the jumbotron, where I'm just getting pummeled by Malone. <laughs> What the just, heck, man? The that that was, I guess the day before they came out with the All-Star team, and A.C. Green AC Green was a starter. Malone was coming off the bench, and I don't think he was happy about that. And he came out, I think, what do you have, 67 or 64? <laughs> I, felt, I 
felt that a little bit. <laughs> that wasn't fun. Fred, it's great to catch up with you, and we uh, appreciate the insight into the 1980-81 BYU basketball team. This was an unbelievable year for BYU athletics overall. Men's golf wins a national title. You have the Miracle Bowl with uh, Jim McMahon and, of course, the Elite Eight run. So what a special time to be at BYU. And baseball was great. That's right. That's right. We were great. And I'm sure I'm leaving out the other teams, but uh, that's what I remember. <laughs> Fred, you're a class act, man. Let's do it again soon. Thanks so much for the time. Great. Thanks, you guys. Good luck to you. Stay stay COVID-free. <laughs> Fred Roberts on the Deseret First Credit Union Highline. Deseret First, you know why. We show how. Fred Roberts was so good on that team. I, like, most people only remember Danny Ainge. But, yeah, Fred Roberts, as we mentioned, and Greg Kite, and, uh, you know, Timo Saralainen ends up being the WAC Player of the Year, as we mentioned. This was an amazing team. This is the best team in BYU basketball history, thus the, thus the reason to do the show. Yes, they beat Princeton, UCLA, and Notre Dame back to back to back in the NCAA tournament. They went won. up against Virginia, who was legit. You know? BYU won five games against teams that finished in the top 20. Pretty awesome. That's amazing. Okay, coming up, who won the season? Uh, you know what? Let's go ahead and put a bow on this season and the show because it deserves some nice, neat packaging. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation, the reviewables rolls on. The show available anytime on demand, the BYU, the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. Or download the podcast for free by Googling BYU Sports Nation podcast. Okay, we ask this question as we look to put a bow on things here. Who won or what won the season in 1980-81? I think Danny Ainge did. He ends up being at this moment in time at the end of the 81 season under contract for the Blue Jays. And in fact, the Blue Jays sent a memo to all the NBA teams saying, don't even try to draft him. Okay. Later, the Celtics do, but not until the second round. He's, he's a top 10 pick if he comes out normally into the NBA. He ends up being disgruntled, doesn't uh, he gets out of his contract. It goes to court. He ends up playing with the Celtics and having a very fruitful NBA career, of course. That's what we know him by. But at this time, he's still a baseball player professionally after this. And he becomes this 88 All-Star, and he's in the three-point contest, and he plays in six NBA Finals, wins two titles uh, as a player, one as a GM. I mean, Danny Ainge won the season, right? Yeah, hard to argue with that. I do like that the perception of BYU basketball on the national scene took a significant step forward. Under Frank Arnold, the previous two seasons, BYU had done enough to get to the second round of the NCAA tournament. And the year before, BYU was a three seed. They're playing in Ogden. They have a great shot, perhaps the greatest shot that they've ever had to get to the Sweet 16, if not further. But they lose to Clemson and Larry Nance. So in 81, when they're a six seed and not expected to do what they did, then they finally capitalize on all that. So the perception of BYU basketball nationally as a whole, I feel like, won the season. BYU was now a consistent program that not just made the tournament and won a game. They were a team that could go deep into the rounds. Yeah, and, and it sort of ended there because they go 17-13 in the, the next year. But this is a team that seven or eight years later is in the top five with the 87-88 team as well and loses to Clemson again in the NCAA tournament. Come on! Um, I, wanted, I want to point out a weird anomaly. So starting in 1951... Every 15 years, BYU does something amazing. Okay? Amazing is an interesting definition. 51, NIT champs. 66, NIT champs. 81, Elite Eight. Now, 96, BYU does something amazing. They only win one game. (laughs) And then in 2011, they go to the Sweet 16. A pattern. So in 2026, something amazing is going to happen with BYU basketball. Hopefully it's good. How about that? I I know. Hopefully it's something good, amazing. One in 26 was amazingly bad, okay? <laughs> Every 15 minutes. Now, credit to you, because I, I had had that thought, that, that line of thinking, the pattern. Oh, oh, that's weird. Every 15 years, 51, 66, 81. But to your credit, you went beyond 1996, 97, because I, st- I stopped. I was like, oh, yeah. Well, it lasted for uh, at least three uh, repetitions of 15 years, and then it all came to a crashing halt. But... It's weird. Amazing doesn't always have to mean like it was good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like the word awesome means, you know, large, right? Or grandiose. Yes. But this is the best team in BYU history. I don't think it's that much of a hot take. Um, what a team. What, what a run of wins at the end. What a group of players that came together. And uh, it was fun to talk to Fred Roberts. Fun to relive this team because... We talk about that Notre Dame play a lot. We've learned more about that Notre Dame play, and hopefully you did as well watching this. 
But this is an all-time team. I think BYU would be hard-pressed to beat what this team did. And hopefully one day BYU makes it into the Final Four. They have the most NCAA tournament appearances without one, which means BYU goes to the tourney a lot, which I is great. I hate that stat so but much. I, I love the they go to the tourney a lot, but I hate the not quite to the Final Four. One time, BYU is going to do it at some point. It's going to happen. This program's too good. They're going to have a magical run. And maybe it was this year and we never saw it. <sighs> that was a lot of fun. Yeah. That was a lot of fun. That was a ton of fun. Both in reference to uh, recapping this show and uh, the season that 2019-2020 BYU basketball put together. Yes, it was. We'll always remember that season. (laughs) Absolutely. Special thanks to our guest today, Fred Roberts, who played in front of that record crowd in the Marriott Center on Danny Ainge's senior night. And sorry to Dennis Pitta. We ran out of time. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag BYUSN. For Jerem Jordan, I am Spencer Linton. Shout out to Alan Taylor, or Big Al as Fred Roberts called him. Go Cougs. We'll see you next time.